Alrighty, let us continue with talking about uh, wave motion. So to recap, uh, we had ended last time talking about the super, we had started talking about superpositions of waves. That waves obey the superposition principle, meaning that two waves, when they overlap, they just simply add perfectly uh, in each location. And they're in, they do not influence each other individually, uh, but what we perceive, what we see in the case of a slinky, what we hear in the case of sound, is a superposition of all the individual waves that are passing through a given point in space. So in the case we saw that there, was, there are uh, constructive interference where two waves work together and as a result you see a similar wave with the same wavelength, same frequency, but larger amplitude. Uh, the amplitude is essentially add in you know, if you have these two waves perfectly interlapping, this upward uh, amplitude and this upward amplitude add together to create something that is roughly twice uh, the sum of those two waves. Uh, assume I drew those waves identical. Versus in this case, where if you have an overlap where one peak is met by another trough, what you get instead is the sum they just cancel each other out, um, and then we would not see, we would not hear or see a lot of motion at that point if you had perfect cancellation uh, with constructive and deconstructive interference. So let's see, there are some examples I can show of that. Um, like in the case of traveling waves with a slinky. You know, waves that are going down a slinky, so here I am, here's John, we're hanging out in the hallway of Galileo. You know, I could take a slinky, I could jerk it at my end uh, with some frequency. That creates, in this case, a wave pulse. Um, or in this case, now I'm actually creating a wave. That travels down the wave. You may have noticed that when I send the wave pulses down, I think you can actually see it better if I do it in the side view, yeah. Um, so you'll see that when I send the wave pulse down, it hits John and comes back. There's a reflection, which we'll talk about in a second. When it hits a new medium, uh, or a change in a medium, waves can reflect. Uh, and, and if you look at, in this case, uh, in the instances where I send multiple waves or a wave down, Sometimes the wave that's going to the right interacts uh, either constructively or destructively with the wave that is returning. And you get you know, more interesting motions that result as a result of the fact that I have waves that I keep sending to the right. There are waves that are bouncing back and coming back to the left. Sometimes they're adding together, sometimes to constructively interfere, uh, creating waves that have larger amplitudes than the ones I'm actually making. You know, like this case, versus some where they tend to cancel each other out and you don't see a lot of motion in the slinky. You know, to use these examples, you know, this part of the slinky right here is not moving nearly as much as these as this area of the slinky was. There are regions of constructive and destructive interference. The slinky is kind of hard to see with that. So we have this cool, we call it the fish skeleton demo where if you were to look at this weird contraption from a bird's eye view, it kind of looks like a fish skeleton, which is why we call it that. It's a bunch of individual um, little rods of metal that are all attached by little springs in the very center, such that they can all move individually, um, but they're coupled to each other. There's slight springs that make, that allow us to do wave motion uh, throughout the medium. And what's nice about this is that it's set up in a way such that the wave speed is fairly small. So we can actually, it's much easier to see a traveling wave go down uh, the skeleton. So in this case, again, notice uh, there's a reflection. When I send a wave pulse that moves to the right, uh, it reflects back. It reflects back in the same way. It didn't flip over like it did for the spring or for the slinky rather, uh, but more on that in a second. Here what I'm trying to demonstrate is eventually I will get to a point where I send multiple um, pulses down and 
one of them will bounce back, and then we will see what happens when the two pulses interact with one another. You can see constructive and destructive interference. Eventually I will do this. There we go. So I'm sending waves down. They're reflecting back. Uh, sometimes they were adding together to create waves that had larger amplitudes. Sometimes they were working against each other in the individual you know, rods of metal. Uh, appeared like it wasn't moving at all, even though there were two waves that were moving through it. And you can kind of see, you can kind of see really well in those two examples. Notice that when they were overlapping with one another, the amplitude got really big for a second, and then as they passed through each other, uh, it went back to normal. Let's see it one more time. It was like right there where it got really big for, for as they passed through one another. Oof. And then again when they kind of pass through each other again. You also notice this is, if you watch the optional lecture, this is damped wave motion because you notice the amplitudes get smaller every time. Um, it's not perfectly frictionless. But that's okay. Constructive and destructive interference is still easy enough to see. Uh, when you have things that work either with each other or against each other. Um, we looked at an example of this with, say, noise-canceling headphones, where you know there are cases where two waves, in this case the blue and the gold, are perfectly overlapping. They constructively interfere to create a wave uh, that would... The rendering is a little slow, so it looks the animation looks kind of bad. Uh, Mathematica is failing me, I guess. <laughs> uh, but when they constructively interfere, you would get a, you would see it would look like a single wave with the, with twice the amplitude moving down. And if it was the case where one of them had a different uh, angular frequency, in this case the gold wave looks like it's moving to the right, where the blue wave is very slightly it looks like yeah very slightly moving to the left. So for some reason the rendering is not happy on board today. But you notice that the wave itself uh, kind of oscillates and changes, and you get this, and you get some sort of single-looking wave pattern, you know, as as a result, uh, as it moves as it moves through. And the idea again with noise canceling headphones, you know, if the gold wave were no, was the noise and the blue wave was the music you're actually trying to listen to, the idea with a noise with noise canceling headphones is that they noise canceling headphones simply tries to reproduce uh, the, the wave of the noise, but make sure that it's offset by 180 degrees. Um, so as a result, you know, the green and the gold, then whenever there's a peak, there's a trough, uh, and whenever there's a trough, there's a peak for between the gold and the green, they end up canceling each other out perfectly then the only thing that's left is that blue curve, which was the music you wanted to hear in the first place. You know, using constructive and destructive interference uh, is essentially the idea behind noise canceling headphones. It is also the idea behind why when you design auditoriums uh, or concert halls that you have to take into account the fact that you know waves are bouncing off the walls and if you have a speaker system, there are ideal places for you to stand and near next to the speakers versus you know uh, versus somewhere else and we can see that again if we do this um, if we think of this as one speaker that's going out let me pause for a second no you can't pause All right, I guess again reset so this kind of medium gray is supposed to mean zero so you, if this were a sound you would hear nothing if you if you were in the region where you had this like medium gray versus the peaks and the troughs are being represented by white and black. Uh, so you can think of each of the black uh, arcs as, you know, it would be peak of a wave and then the white represents the trough. You can notice they kind of blur together as they go out. That's more just the intensity goes down. You know, sound appear, appears, uh, not appears, he, uh, uh, he, you hear it fainter the farther you are away from the speaker.
Uh, turns out that the intensity of sound, how much energy is getting to your ear every second, also has an inverse square relationship, just like what we saw for gravity. So what's going on here with a single speaker, you notice that if you're standing at a certain location, you can kind of put you know, a, a dial here, you can see at that certain location, you would hear a wave that would come at you. And if this had some frequency, um, a particular frequency, you might hear it as you know a tone of music or something. And then someone else standing, you know, half a wavelength away, you know, they would also hear the same way, but it would just be offset by a little bit. Um, they would hear the same thing. It might take a little bit long. It would take, you know, slightly longer for them to hear it initially, uh, but they would hear more or less the same thing. Versus if there are two speakers that are playing the same thing, they will start to constructively and destructively interfere with one another. Where sometimes there will be locations where both of the speakers always have, you know, their peaks are overlapping with each other whenever they cross a certain point. But unfortunately, then there's also places where no matter what's going on, there's always, you know, where, whenever a peak from the top speaker hits, a trough from the lower speaker hits. You kind of see in these kind of medium gray arcs right here, these dead zones. Or again, if I were to put, you know, a, a sensor there, notice what they ultimately hear is something that appears very slight uh, compared to what, say, someone right here would be hearing. Uh, the this sensor, this this sensor here, um, essentially is in a dead zone where that would be not a great place for them to stand if they wanted to hear this music. Essentially, they're always getting destructive interference from the two speakers. Uh, they would it would be much harder for them to make out the sound. Versus this person is actually in a pretty good spot. They're at a location, you know, or I can move them here. You know, they're at a location where these two wave fu functions are always constructively inter uh, interfering with one another. They're working together or adding together. Or in this case, they're canceling each other out. Uh, and then if one of the speakers were to turn off, you know, the wave would eventually make its way out and they would eventually start to hear the same thing. Notice the amplitude of the, the dead zone went up. The amplitude of the person who initially had constructive interference uh, decreased back down because it's now just a single wave that they're hearing. You know, I could, we could demonstrate that, but just one at a time. You know, so here's the person that's going to be in the dead zone. They're initially hearing this. The second speaker turns on. Eventually, the waves start to destructively interfere with one another. Uh, they ultimately don't hear very much. Then if the speaker turns off, one of the speakers turns off, it eventually returns back to normal. Actually, I need to know where the constructive interference is. Versus the this, this second person. So if someone was standing kind of in the middle between the two speakers there, you know, with one speaker, they hear a particular waveform. Then when both speakers turn on, there's an adjustment where they happen to be in a sweet spot where there's constructive interference and notice the amplitude that they would perceive goes up. The speakers work together. They would hear a larger sound, the result of two speakers compared to just one. That is the idea behind constructive and destructive interference. <laughs> so with some of those movies, you notice that when there were, ref that there were cases of reflection, where when a wave was sent down, say the slinky, it bounced back and came back to me once it hit a different medium, in this case, John. And you can see that in the case of the slinky, if I swing my hand one way, the reflected wave comes back in the opposite direction. Let's do it again. You know, I swung it to the right and it came back on the left side of the slinky. Versus for the fish, for the fish skeleton, I sent a wave you know, on the top or on the bottom, let's see what I do. Sent it on the top, it comes back on the top. The reflected waves uh, are slightly different in these two cases. So what is going on that's different between these two kinds of reflecting waves? <laughs> 
and it depends on wh whether or not the boundary that the wave hits, essentially the wave comes, you know, it's traveling down this, this uh, skeleton, and it hits a boundary where the metal rods stop and it has to and then it has to decide you know if the wave motion is to continue and it reflects on itself it has to make a decision whether it's going to reflect in the same way or in the opposite way similarly with the slinky it hits a boundary of john's hand the wave can't really keep going forward it tries um but then forces from John's hand actually cause the fact that John is holding the slinky perfectly stationary. That requires force. Uh, it would not remain stationary if John wasn't there. Uh, where in the case of the fish skeleton, uh, there is nothing there to hold, say, these pieces of metal in place, and the behavior is slightly different. So that's the difference between a closed and an open boundary. So we can try to sketch some pictures of what this looks like. Let's do the case of if it's a closed boundary. Um, so it could be the example where I'm holding the rope and I send a pulse down that is traveling down the slinky or the rope or whatever. And it gets to a region where it is firmly attached to a wall or someone's hand or you know, something that is a fixed, say a fixed wall say. What happens is this, that this pulse travels and travels and eventually comes to a point where it reaches, the, the, uh, the wave itself reaches the wall. And if we analyze what's going on with the rope itself, you know, here's the wave, it's traveling this direction. This is again an example of a transverse wave. The wave itself is moving to the right. The, the individual elements of the slinky or the spring or whatever it is uh, are not moving to the right, but they are instead moving up or down, up and down. In this case, their individual motion is perpendicular to the wave motion, which is the definition of a transverse wave. And this results from, you know, tension forces, say, uh, that are being applied along the rope, the slinky, the what have you that are causing some net acceleration, either up or down, which creates the oscillatory motion. When the wave gets to this point where it's now at a fixed boundary, this particular molecule of slinky um, it cannot move. It wants to go up. The wave wants to make everything kind of rise up and then it comes back down. But in this case, that one that is fixed to the wall, is it cannot move because it's also feeling a very strong force from the wall that is holding it in place. The slinky itself is trying to move that molecule up, but then the wall itself, um, there's a force from the wall that is tugging down on that, on that string, or that piece of the slinky or the string, to make sure that there's no net acceleration. That force impacts the tension that is locally in the string. Remember, we thought of the string as you can think of a spring as a bunch of tiny little springs, that's essentially what tension is, uh, along the rope, along the slinky. And so this force from the wall then starts tugging down on all the on all the other molecules of the slinky or the rope that are very local to that are local to that region. And so as a result, they feel a strong acceleration to get pulled downward. And as a result, if this is if I did not want that to be blue. Yeah, so it essentially gets pulled down you know, because of the wall. And so then the waveform ends up following, you know, the, the ones that are close to the wall feel the strong tug down down below this kind of for, this horizontal. As a result, the wave ends up inverting itself and gets reflected back in, in the opposite direction.
inverted during the reflection. Somehow that says during. So when you have a fixed closed boundary, the reflection is an inversion, which is what we saw with the slinky. Um, the force from John's hand ex essentially exerts a very strong force on the, uh, the medium that the wave is traveling down, and it inverts itself, in this case, for a transverse wave. And I think there's even an applet that can show this. Yeah, so this is, I guess, like this the little simulation version of this, where uh, if you have, you know, a pulse that you can just send out into the air uh, and just keeps going, if there's no medium change, you know, abrupt medium change has to deal with. If you keep it fixed, what happens is, right, so because this one particle is not allowed to move, even though it feels a strong force to move, for this, the slinky of the rope, in this case, to move it upwards when the wave is traveling to the right, that results um, in a strong force that comes from the wall, from whatever is holding the wave medium fixed, uh, which causes it to reflect back. And then they can even interfere with one another if I send multiple pulses. Oh dear. Okay. Now the question is, what happens if now there's a loose end? So the idea with the loose end is it is free to move, um, but it is free to move on this end, but it's still constrained, you know, to be along, say, this, you know, the wave traveling along the string, for example. Uh, so in that case, the pulse does allow the object to move uh, even the, the molecules, the pieces of the rope, the string, and what have you, uh, that are at the very end, they, it is free to move. And as a result, um, it just follows, it just goes along for the ride, essentially. Uh, that bead on the end also undergoes a simple harmonic oscillation. Um, and then as a result, it essentially just does an identical yank, you know, a frequency, you know, swing, if, if you were thinking of this as someone swinging, swinging the slinky. Uh, and the pulse that gets shot back is the same pulse with, you know, if it was on the top, it comes back on the top. If it was on the bottom, it comes back on the bottom. Notice in this case, it's showing you both examples. The loose end, it's reflecting back the same way. The oscillator, the pulse maker here, it's treating as a fixed end point. So notice that the fixed end point, it gets reflected back, inverted, or in this case, it gets reflected back in the original direction. So essentially, it's the difference of the what are your boundary conditions. There are con different constraints that are being that have to be obeyed at the ends of uh, the rope in this case. And this is the same thing as what the uh, what the fish skeleton demo is like as well. Um, essentially, it is free, and nothing is constraining the the pieces of metal on this end as well. It can just you know, if it if it, if the uh, springs want the thing to oscillate upwards, it will oscillate upwards. But since they're all tied to one another through springs in the center. That oscillatory motion impacts what's going on nearby, uh, and it gets reflected back. <laughs> so, let's see, going back to this. So for an open end, it's reflected without inversion. 
If you have some sort of closed medium, like say an organ pipe, a guitar string, um, all right, musical instruments, for example, um, you can get what is called standing waves, uh, where uh, the uh, constructive and destructive interference patterns make the wave appear fixed. Um, so it appears you so so you have a wave motion that appears to not be moving yet there's clearly waves that are going down you know say down the string in multiple directions yeah. uh, in the case of say a guitar string or um, in the case of me shaking a slinky continuously so I think it's as easy as to show this via example Is this the right one? Yes. All right, so here's the idea. This would have been a lab you would have done. Um, so essentially I have a long string that is attached to a hanging mass that creates some tension in the string. So the string you can think of as being fixed here and here, so two closed ends. And then this is a pulse, it's attached to a pulse generator that is bobbing up and down at a frequency that is given by whatever I set by this dial to be. So here it's oscillating at almost three times per second. You can see it kind of bounced up and down and it bounces up and down about three times every second. That creates a wave that is going down this uh, taut string. The idea is if I ramp up the current, sorry, not the current, the frequency, it starts to shake the string faster and faster and faster you can notice that if I were to, you know, start and, start and stop at different times, the image looks quite different. Uh, sometimes there's big bumps here, sometimes there's big bumps here. No, you know, uh, spaces where things are not quite moving. Waves are going down that string. They're bouncing off, they're bouncing off the other side. And they're working against and with each other in a way where nothing seems quite... Uh, Nothing quite um, uh, evens itself out. You know, in the case of a more simple example, uh, let's see if I make this, you know, some weird, weird frequency where I'm shaking it. There's some motion uh, that results. Um, in this case, it kind of builds up together. Actually, I think I accidentally found a standing wave. Right, where the peaks are, like our constant, are, are changing frequently, though not quite as much uh, here as what I'm seeing. I'm doing a terrible job of this. Let's go back to the movies. Uh, I definitely can do this poorly with this with the slinky. Yeah, in this case, right? You know, I'm shake, I'm shaking, I'm shaking the slinky. I'm sending waves down. Waves are coming back. They're not necessarily, uh, you're not getting nice standing patterns where it looks like nothing's moving. You, know, you can clearly tell that things are moving. I can see kind of some wave motion that's going you know, to the left and to the right, where the peaks and troughs are seem to be changing. As opposed to when I do something like, like this, where again, like the points here don't really seem to be moving. Just kind of seems instead of looking like a wave is moving down to the right or or back to the left, it just looks like the spring is bouncing up and down. Uh, everything appears more or less stationary, except uh, in the perpendicular direction. All right. So in this case, uh, that is an example of a standing wave. See, I try to find it here. 
where in this case you can see the up and down motion, but it doesn't look like anything's moving to the left or to the right. Yes, one. Uh, where it just looks like, you know, it just looks like if I you just imagine swinging, you know, like, um, swinging the string up and down, uh, so you see that upward and downward motion, but it doesn't look like the wave is actually moving left or right. That is an example of a standing wave. And in this case, I'm going to up the frequency some more. Notice when I went, you know, when it, back when it was at about 10 hertz, we saw that nice standing wave. It didn't look like anything was moving left or right, but we saw that upward and down motion. Now I've adjusted it away from that value. And I can see the wave motion again. I can see that sometimes this area wiggles more than this, than this, uh, where I see the peaks and troughs appear to be changing. I have a sense that there is some sort of traveling motion. But then as I up the frequency to about 20 hertz or so. Notice again, we get an example of a standing wave. I can't really tell that the wave is moving left and right, but I do see it just moving up and down. This point right here, right in the middle, appears almost to be perfectly stationary. In fact, it would be, it is perfectly stationary if it's exactly right, uh, if we found exactly the right frequency to make the standing wave, where all the waves I'm sending to the right are all interacting with the waves that are coming back um, to the left, such that the, you know, they constructively interfere at some locations and you see really big amplitudes, and they all perfectly create a net, a destructive interference right, right here at the center and that piece of the string is essentially stationary. Let me define some terms and then we can look more at this, uh, this demo. So in the case of the standing wave, again, the string is oscillating wildly. Um, but the constructive and destructive interference patterns are creating are creating nodes where which have little to no motion. Versus anti nodes, where there is an increased amplitude because it's always con there. All the waves are always constructively interfering with one another, as a as a result. So going back here, I'm upping it again now, closer to about thirty. Notice again, I found another example of a standing wave uh, for a given for this particular frequency. The wave does not appear to be to be moving. I've upped the frequency, which again, since it's the same string, I am decreasing the wavelength of the waves that I'm sending down. Um, and I'm adjusting it so I find a location, which looks like here, where I have three peaks or two nodes, uh, three anti nodes. Increasing the frequency, decreasing the wavelength as a result. Notice when you find it, you know you found it, um, because when you had when you are not quite at the right frequency. Essentially, now we're getting to the point where every t for every wave that's moving to the right, there's another wave that's moving to the left, and if they're not perfectly working with one another uh, to create these nodes and anti nodes, they essentially on average are going to cancel each other out. Then when you find that standing wave frequency, in this case it's about 40 or so, now you get nice, beautiful constructive interference and destructive interference. So four anti-nodes, three nodes. Looks like I have found the next possible standing wave. <laughs>
three, four, five, six. Yeah. Six anti nodes, five. And it's five anti nodes, not including the ones at the endpoints. Yes. It would be unwise to try to put your finger in between, you know, in the middle of, you know, oops, in the middle of those kind of uh, regions where there's large constructive interference. Uh, the string is definitely oscillating very quickly in those regions. Uh, you would not be able to stick your finger through this, you know, fast enough. Because it's oscillating 63 times a second. See how when it, you get close enough and find it, the amplitude really d shows itself. It's not perfect. Notice it's kind of fluctuating a little bit, so I didn't quite perfectly find it there. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight anti nodes. So this is also demonstrating that this does not occur for any arbitrary frequency. There are very particular frequencies that will work in this case. Um, and what frequencies those are depends on the wave speed, uh, how fast the waves are traveling left and right down the string, as well as the length of the string itself. Uh, it essentially depends, and we'll show this mathematically in a second, it depends on how many waves essentially can fit um, and obey the right boundary conditions, you know, whether the object has to be open or closed at the end. In this case, it's closed at both ends. The, the string is anchored down here and here. I don't know what we're up to at this point. Um, so since it's anchored at the endpoints, uh, those always have to be anti-nodes in a sense. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, but now it is oscillating 104, almost 105 times per second. How far do I go? It still says there's like a minute left here. Surely this is the last time I try this. Oh, wow, I go all in. Well, maybe, kinda. I kinda see little bumps. Second decimal spot now. This doesn't look perfect. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. There, yeah, that's okay. I trust I can count. Yes. So these standing waves play a very important role in music. Essentially, when you pluck a guitar string, the sound you hear um, is that you are creating waves that are traveling along the strings. And in this case, you know, it's fixed at both ends, you know, both this end and this end. And when you pluck the guitar string, you are essentially setting up a series of standing waves and that motion, that standing wave motion, relates to the sounds that you ultimately end up hearing. 
You know, so the fact that I can pluck this guitar string and get a particular note versus if I change the length of the string by putting my finger down on, on the fretboard and it changes the note that's being played, um, I have adjusted the length of the string such that there are different standing waves that can then be created, uh, which then ties into the note I ultimately can hear. It's the same idea with, say, uh, when you blow into a flute or, you know, run air through an organ pipe. Uh, the, what, the note that you hear, um, or the notes that you hear, relates to the kind of standing waves that can be set up in the tube. Those, you noticed, if we, went, if we go back to one of these earlier cases, when there were standing waves set up, the amplitude of the ultimate overall standing wave is much larger than what the amplitudes of the individual waves were. There are regions where everything's kind of working together. Larger amplitudes result, in the case of music, result in larger volume, uh, which then allows you to, uh, you know, you hear a particular note compared to others. Before we do that, let's do a little review of the idea behind constructive and destructive interference. So if we wanted to think quantitatively about what those dead zones were, I asked, what is the difference in path lengths from speakers along these node lines? Again, nodes, now, now we're seeing you know, those are the regions where you're always getting de you know, perfect destructive interference and you're essentially hearing nothing. Uh, though, you know, if this were uh, if this were a vibrating string, this would be places where the string would not be moving. If we wanted to think about an actual wave, which can be defined by wavelength, so the distance and space it takes to go uh, before you see, start to see repetition, remember that destructive interference. means that you add the two objects, you, you add the two things together, so looking at this thing at the top, you add, you're adding the two waves together, um, and they're canceling each other out, in this case, everywhere. If you look at this and think of the wavelength, you know, if, I take the if I take the black curve and keep drawing it out, it would look something like this. Remember, the wavelength is you know, peak to peak, trough to trough, whatever. You know, how long you go before you start to see repetition. And then the blue wave, um, which is the same wave, so it has the same wavelength. Oops. But it might be moving, say, to the left instead of to the right. Notice they are offset by half a wavelength. Offsetting by half a wavelength means that wherever one of them has a peak, the other one is at its trough, etc. Uh, so in that case, everything always cancels out. So the answer in this case would be B. They are offset along half a wavelength. Um, so if you had a particular sound that you wanted to play through a speaker, you could actually identify exactly where these dead zones are going to be. Um, and then usually with concert halls and whatnot, you construct the acoustics of the walls, the roof, what, not, what have you, so that you always get some reflection uh, that doesn't result in perfect destructive interference like this. You don't have any dead zones. Ideally, you want to amplify um, and have constructive interference whenever you can and to minimize the locations where you get destructive interference. Um, it's inevitable, you'll always have some of that, uh, but ideally that destructive interference is, you know, somewhere in the air, uh, not where someone is sitting. Because uh, presumably no one is floating up, you know, in the middle of the concert hall. Uh, so there's de destructive interference up there, who cares? Uh, you just don't want destructive interference where people are sitting. So the idea with a standing wave, if you want, if I ask you to find the frequencies that are possible to get these standing waves, you know, suppose I have some string of length L and it's fixed 
and it's fixed at both ends. A way that I could figure out the possible standing waves is to ask myself, you know, if I'm going to shake this string at a particular frequency, um, I wanted to set I wanted to set up so that there are, um, you know, some form of some fraction of of a wavelength uh, or some multiple of a wavelength, such that there is always two uh, um, nodes, dead zones, dead points. Uh, at the very ends, because those ends are fixed. They cannot move. They are constrained to always be, you know, I could not have a wave that looks like, that looks like this, for example. Because there is a contradiction that the string is fixed here, yet the string itself is all the way up here. So whatever I draw has to have, say, you know, the string, you know, coming out, you know, in these directions, you know, they, it must come down to those fixed endpoints if I'm going to have any hope of, um, of coming up with standing waves. So in this case, where it's fixed at both ends, one example of a standing wave might be the one where I just shake the entire string up and down. You know, so something that, that oscillates between this and this. You know, so the entire thing is moving you know, the entire thing goes up and then the entire thing goes down and then it oscillates uh, from there. That is an example of a possible standing wave that occur. I could adjust the frequency given the, the speed of the wave. I could adjust the frequency such that um, the interference pattern adds up to become something that looks like this. You know, essentially just one big wave that oscillates up and down. This is the longest wavelength possible. Particularly, this is the longest wavelength possible for a standing wave. If I want to create a standing wave, this is the longest uh, possible wavelength uh, that I could find. Um, I can't find one that's longer because uh, finding one that's longer it means you know the distance between individual peaks and troughs for example gets even bigger um, and there's no way I can do that without without also having the string be fixed at both ends. You know again just to show you another example I can't have to say the string start here and come out and end here. Um, you know, that is not an example that works because it's not fixed at the uh, end point here. This, that point would oscillate up and down, which contradicts the idea that it's fixed at that end. This longest wavelength is called the fundamental tone. Or the fundamental mode, sometimes I think it's also called. That occurs when you have this right balance of, and you might hear the word re, you know, resonances uh, uh, used when talking about this, um, the right combination of interference patterns that create a standing wave that has the longest wavelength possible, which is called the fundamental tone. Sometimes we call, I might call this lambda. Um, well, I guess it's some, it's also called the first harm, first harmonic, so I'll call it lambda one. Right, fundamental tone or the first harmonic. In this case, L. If I ask what is this wavelength numerically, notice that L captures half the wavelength. This first fundamental tone, first harmonic, um, if I were to write you know, what it is, it is twice the length of the string in this case. 
This ends up being the note you hear when you pluck a, a piano key or when you pluck a guitar string. You know, when I, you know, I have a little tuner here. You know, when I take my tuner um, and I pluck a guitar, and I pluck, in this case, a string, and it says, right, that I'm playing A, there is a frequency that corresponds to, to that particular note. Um, what I'm hearing here, the note that registers uh, in a tuner, or the notes that you learn are associated with particular piano keys, uh, that is the fundamental tone of that, of that uh, note or string. You know, in the case of a piano, where keys are actually plucking you know, strings that are inside the piano, each of those strings have a particular tension. Um, it might be different thicknesses as well, adjusted in such a way so that when you pluck it, uh, the first largest uh, fundamental tone, the first harmonic, the largest possible wavelength that could fit on that string and become a standing wave is the note you hear. But like what we saw in the demo, that is not the only possible standing wave that can fit um, in this case. In this case, we saw another example could be that if, again, if I require that it's fixed at the endpoints, uh, another possible standing wave could be it comes up, comes down, comes back up again. And so then it oscillates between these two. You know, it oscillates up and down here. There's a, there's a node right in the center. And this is another, this is, again, to remind us the node where that piece of the string doesn't really move, but the other ends of the strings, you know, in between all of these, these three nodes, um, you get very large amplitudes. This is the second longest wavelength that fits. So this, unsurprisingly, is called the second harmonic. And in this case, it looks like the second harmonic uh, is the same length as the length of the string. I complete one full wavelength when I go from one end of the string to the other, which has length L. Let's do one more. And then we get, well, essentially, I think at this point, we'll be able to see a pattern emerging. Here's my length L. I want to require that it's fixed at both ends. One way I could do that is something like this, where it oscillates between these two examples, up and down, up and down, up and down. And now there are two nodes in the center. In this case, it looks like there's, I can count the wavelengths. Okay, so here's one full wavelength, and then it looks like I then have an additional half a wavelength. So it looks like here, length L equals one and a half wavelengths um, of the third harmonic. So in this case, notice that we had, for the fundamental tone, we had, it was lambda over two. For the second harmonic, it was two lambda over two, or just lambda. For the third harmonic, it was three lambda over two. In general, you can convince yourself that this formula will give you the wavelengths of all the standing possible waves that are that are allowed tell me the length l of my of my you know guitar string or whatever then i'll tell you that the possible wavelengths that can create standing waves must obey this essentially sim simple geometric relationship where n in this case is just a number you know, if I plug in n equals 1, that is the fundamental tone, the first harmonic. If I plug in n equals 2, that gives me the wavelength for the second harmonic, etc.
Uh, or, if I wanted to write this in terms of lambda itself, this would say that 2L over N, where N can be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. are the harmonics you might say the harmonics of a closed closed uh, system or instrument those are what po those are the possible standing waves that are that are allowed Given also that the speed of the wave is given by its wavelength times its frequency, one of the relationships we saw last time, I believe, the velocity is set by the medium, the string, the tension in the string, perhaps if it's a guitar string, the temperature of the air, if it's the air. This suggests that the possible frequencies that are allowed are V is whatever V divided by lambda is. So I could figure out the wavelength of the fundamental, turn that into a frequency. I could figure out the wavelength of the, of the second harmonic, turn that into a frequency. So in this case, this would be something like N V of the wave over two L for N equals one, two, three, et cetera. Perhaps also worth a highlight uh, if you're interested in music is this is essentially telling you what are the frequencies that you hear. You know, when we say that, you know, A is 440 hertz, when you play uh, the note A, which I think I have that somewhere. Uh, I don't think this is 440. No, it's not 440. Uh, but when you play a particular note, um, it has a particular frequency. There we go. That frequency um, is determined, uh, you know, what you hear when you pluck a string, for example, um, the frequency that comes out, the note that gets played, um, is the fundamental, so it's if I plug in n equals 1, Figure out what is the speed of the wave, you know, along the guitar string or through the air um, for a guitar string of a given length. That is the note that that's that's played. <laughs> 